నమస్తే వెల్కమ్ బ్యాక్ టు మై రిలీజ్ వర్ల్డ్ ఆఫ్ ఫిజిక్స్ ఎక్స్పెరిమెంటల్ ఇన్వెస్టిగేషన్స్ ఇన్ ది ఫీల్డ్ ఆఫ్ న్యూక్లియర్ ఫిజిక్స్ ఆఫన్ ఇన్వాల్వ్ ది డీటెయిల్డ్ స్టడీస్ ఆన్ ది రేడియేషన్స్ ఆర్ పార్టికల్స్ విచ్ ఆర్ ఎమిటెడ్ ఫ్రమ్ ఎక్సైటెడ్ న్యూక్లియర్ దిస్ ఎక్సైటెడ్ న్యూక్లియర్ క్యాన్ బి ఐదర్ నేచురలీ ఒకరింగ్ ఆర్ మే బి ఆర్టిఫిషియలీ ప్రొడ్యూస్డ్ the first type of process is called natural radioactivity and was discovered by henry becquerel in the year 1896 the second category is called artificial or induced radioactivity and was discovered by irene and joliot curie in the year 1933 the idea behind such studies is the fact that the particles or radiations which are emitted from these excited nuclei carry vital information uh about the nucleus and its properties and interactions in an earlier video uh in my channel i had explained the general layout for a nuclear physics experiment uh, this involves a source for generating the energetic particles or radiations which bombard a target which is nothing but a collection of a large number of nuclei of interest and then um suitable detectors to detect the outgoing particles or radiations and a set of dedicated nuclear electronic instruments uh, which process and analyze the detector output pulses in the early days of nuclear physics experimental investigation um, natural sources of radiations or particles uh, were used for these investigations but such sources suffer from some of the following disadvantages first of all as you have already seen uh, the radioactive sources emit only limited types of particles namely alpha beta and gamma rays secondly the energies of these radiations or particles are limited to less than about 8 mev for alphas and gammas and around 3 mev for the beta particles thirdly uh, apart for the beta particles which have continuous energy distribution uh, the other two types have discrete energies uh, and not continuously variable also the intensities of these radiations and particles are limited to less than about 10 raised to 7 per second it is seen that in order to carry out meaningful nuclear investigations we require different types of particles with variable energies ranging up to several hundreds of mevs or higher and with varying intensities preferably in the range of 10 raised to 12 per second as more and more experimental investigations were undertaken the requirements became more and vast and demanding ideally we require a source which can provide any energetic particle electrons neutrons protons alphas lithium beryllium etc up to uranium with any desired required variable energy and with any desired intensity preferably in the range of about 10 raised to 12 per second or even higher these requirements necessitated the developments of new devices called particle accelerators these do the job of accelerating charged particles to any required energy and they also should provide the required variable intensity that means flux of these particles in today's video we will be discussing the physics of particle accelerators okay as you have seen particle accelerators are devices to produce beams of charged particles and to accelerate them to high velocities that means high energies so essentially the output of an accelerator would be a narrow beam of energetic particles all these particles having the same mass and charge and a nearly constant velocity and thereby energy of course uh, we will have to allow for a small variation in the energy by delta e so the aim would be to reduce delta e as much as possible all these particles will have parallel trajectories more or less and the beam will have very small cross section of the order of 1 mm or so in some special cases this diameter may even be much smaller than this uh, of the order of micrometers now one question that may arise is why accelerate the particles at all the answer is if you want to see the finer details within the subatomic particles we need a wavelength lambda uh, of the light that we use for uh, observation much smaller than the size of the object required uh, of course lambda can be written as h by p where p is the momentum of the particle uh, of the radiation h is the planck's constant so in terms of the mass and energy of the particle this would be h by square root of 2 mp that means higher the energy the finer will be the details that we can get from our observation now if we look at the collision between two nuclei there are 
essentially two forces which come into play. Firstly, we have the Coulomb force between the positive charges on the two nuclei. Uh, this is a long range force. It is also repulsive. So here we have this Coulomb uh, potential on this graph. It shows the variation of the potential with respect to the internuclear distance r. The second is the nuclear potential, nuclear force, which is uh, of much short range. Uh, and in contrast to the Coulomb force, this is attractive force. So the interplay between the Coulomb force, the repulsive Coulomb force and the attractive nuclear force uh, is that we get a net potential uh, which is something like this. So we see that there is a pocket and a potential barrier. So this potential barrier is known as the Coulomb barrier. Uh, this will occur at a distance Rb from the center of the line joining the two particles. So because of this uh, potential barrier, if we have an arbitrary energy of the incident particle which is less than this Coulomb barrier, then uh, we cannot, classically we cannot achieve fusion between the two particles. So if we want the incident particle to go inside the potential well here. So we require an energy essentially above the Coulomb barrier. So that means we have to accelerate the incident particle so that it can have an energy which is above Vb. So that is uh, the main reason why we make use of an accelerator. So we require energies above the Coulomb barrier, hence the necessity to accelerate the particles to higher energies. Uh, here I have uh, shown in a blown up uh, schematic the accelerated beam of particles. So these parallel lines indicate the trajectories of the different ions within the beam. Uh, as I mentioned the cross section of the beam will be of uh, diameter around about 1 millimeter and these trajectories are supposed to be parallel. However, uh, the trajectories may slightly diverge. Why? This is mainly due to the repulsion of the individual particles because all these are positively charged or in some cases they may be negatively charged but they are of the same uh, sign as far as the charge is concerned. So there will be uh, inter-particle repulsion. So we need a way to restore the directions of the particles to the desired axis. So this is essentially focusing the beam and this is achieved using suitable electrical magnetic fields. Uh, this we may discuss in some later video. Now what is the method of acceleration? That means what is the method of uh, imparting higher energies to these incident particles? Obviously they are charged particles and therefore the simplest method would be by subjecting the charged particles to an electric field. So if you have an electric field E, uh, then for a particle having charge Q, the force will be Q into E. So under the influence of this electrostatic field, the particles will gain energy. So what do we do? We start with positively charged particles at high voltage. Let them fall to ground potential. So from the high voltage point to the ground potential, there is a region where there is force, which guides these particles from the high voltage point to the ground potential. So we essentially say they are falling from the high voltage point to the ground potential. And in this process they will accelerate. And we know the energy acquired will be equal to the charge times the potential that means Q times V. So if you have a 1 million volts potential and uh, if you have a proton that means Q is equal to 1. So we essentially will have 1 MeV energy. So here uh, this is a simple schematic where uh, such type of acceleration is illustrated. So we have, we have a positive high voltage potential terminal uh, having a voltage V then a charged particle with positive charge equal to Q is situated just uh, on the periphery of this uh, terminal and uh, this is the ground potential uh, enclosure. So we have a, an electric field starting from the high voltage terminal to the ground potential point. So these particles are um, accelerated in this field 
the force is Q into the field, Q multiplied by the field and the final energy achieved is equal to Q into V. The following animation demonstrates uh, the acceleration process. A magnetic field cannot produce acceleration um, in the sense that the energy of the particles cannot be increased. The reason being that the so-called Lorentz force which acts on these particles because of the magnetic field is given by F is equal to QV cross B uh, which means that this particular force will be in a direction perpendicular to both the velocity and the magnetic field. So therefore the actual magnitude of the force uh, velocity cannot be changed. Only there can be bending, a deviation of the particles from the uh, incident direction. Uh, however, magnetic fields can be used to focus the particle beams. Uh, precisely, again, because of this uh, force which is normal to the direction of the velocity. Let us see what are the main components of an accelerator. Uh, firstly, there should be a source of ions which are to be accelerated. Then, secondly, the basic accelerating portion itself then the focusing elements then comes the energy analyzer which selects uh, particles which have a definite energy then of course finally we will have a bending magnet uh, whereby the direction of the accelerated beams would be suitably changed so as to enter uh, the required experimental arrangement now we'll see what are the main types of accelerators the first one is obviously the electrostatic accelerator. These use electrostatic fields to increase the energy. As I already mentioned, if you have a high voltage of 1 million volts, the energy of particles like protons, for example, uh, will be 1 MeV. However, the maximum value of V is limited by dielectric breakdown of the medium in which the accelerator is situated. For higher energies, radio frequency electric fields are used, RF fields. These can work with relatively lower values of the voltages, typically a few hundreds of kilovolts. The trick is to use a larger number of individual accelerating stages, each giving an energy boost of the order of hundreds of keVs. So in fact, the final energy will be n times Q into V, where n is the number of such stages. So therefore, any desired energy can be achieved in principle by selecting a large enough value of the number of stages using manageable voltages V. The electrostatic accelerators are seen to have simple design and these were the first ones to be used. Here, a static electric field is obtained by applying a potential difference across two parallel electrodes using a suitable power supply. So if you have a positive ion which is situated near the anode, it will experience a force which drives it towards the cathode and in that process it will gain energy. Uh, on the other hand, if you have a negatively charged ion and if it is generated near the cathode, then similarly it will experience a force in the opposite direction and it will get accelerated towards the anode. Uh, at least some of you might have noticed that there exist accelerators in nature itself. This can be called natural accelerators. The most familiar example is thunder, cloud and lightning. When cosmic rays enter our atmosphere, they strip electrons of the air molecules. If a strong lightning bolt happens at the same time, it acts as an electric field, triggering an electron avalanche that launches the stray particles skyward in a narrow beam. So this is a natural um, example for an accelerator. Now we have other examples in our living room itself, uh, the old television sets have built-in electron accelerators. These are nothing but the cathode ray tubes. So in this, the electrons generated by a heated filament will be accelerated in a potential of the order of 15 to 20 kilovolts. These fall on a fluorescent screen and uh, they produce um, scintillations or fluorescence on the screen. Also, in the oscilloscopes which are used in teaching labs, industries, etc. to observe various uh, waveforms, etc. They also have a cathode ray tube which is an accelerator. The first practical particle accelerator 
using the electrostatic acceleration principle uh, was the Cockcroft Walton accelerator, which was named after the scientist who developed this accelerator in 1932, namely John Cockcroft and Ernst Walton. Uh, they used a voltage multiplier to generate the high voltage. So this is a simple schematic of a uh, voltage doubler. In their accelerator, which is also called the cascade generator or cascade accelerator, um, they have a cascade of such voltage doublers. So they generate uh, voltages to the tune of uh, up to about 4 million volts and uh, this will be applied to the high voltage terminal of the actual accelerator part. So the ions will also be situated somewhere just below the terminal and uh, the ions released from this would be accelerated downward uh, from the high voltage terminal to the ground potential point. So outside the accelerator we get the accelerator B. Obviously here also the high voltage will be limited by dielectric breakdown of the medium in which uh, the voltage field is produced. Also there were difficulties in the design of high voltage power supplies in the early, early stages. Uh, obviously here we have Cockcroft and Walton standing near their first accelerator. The Cockcroft Walton accelerator had the distinction of being the first to produce an artificial nuclear disintegration by bombarding lithium with the accelerated protons. Lithium on protons yield two alpha particles. So this was the first artificial nuclear disintegration. Later on improvements were made over Croft Walton accelerator. The high voltage and therefore the energy limit can be raised by replacing the ladder of rectified voltages with an insulating belt to transport charge as was done in the Van de Graaff accelerator. The improvement was to develop the high voltage by continuously transferring charge from a power supply to the high voltage terminal. The developed high voltage would be Q1 by V is equal to Q by C where Q is the total charge transferred and C is the capacitance of the system. Uh, there are two basic principles uh, involved in the development of the voltage on the terminal. The first one is of course the what is known as the corona discharge. We know that the electric field is at a particular point at a distance r from a charge q is given by e is equal to 1 by 4 pi epsilon 0 q by r squared. It is well known that electric discharge occurs readily in air or gases near pointed conductors because the electric field is quite concentrated near these pointed conductors. Second principle is a hollow spherical conductor is an equipotential surface the potential inside being a constant. Therefore, uh, this is our spherical conductor, part of the spherical conductor. A total charge Q is transferred to it and uh, this will develop a voltage Q by C on this and uh, we have a constant potential inside. Any amount of charge can be transferred to it from inside irrespective of the original charge on it. So therefore, we can go on supplying charge to the high voltage terminal if the source of the charge is kept inside. Therefore, theoretically any desired high voltage can be attained using relatively smaller voltage power supplies as compared to the Cockcroft Walton accelerator. However, the problem regarding dielectric breakdown will still persist. Van de Graaff who devised the first Van de Graaff accelerator surmounted this difficulty by enclosing the accelerating stages within an enclosure which is filled with an insulating gas at high pressures. So, using this insulating gas at high pressure will increase the dielectric breakdown voltage. So, therefore, that way the high voltage limit can be boosted. This is a schematic of the Van de Graaff accelerator and uh, this is Van de Graaff himself. So, we have the high voltage terminal. Uh, this is the metal dome to collect positive charges. Then we have an insulating belt which is run over to pulleys. This is enclosed within a high pressure tank wherein SF6 gas is filled under high pressure. Now we have the power supply here let's say of the order of 10 kilo volts. There are two very sharp metallic points which is cut just touching the surface of the belt. One on the positive from the positive terminal of the power supply and another 
from the high voltage terminal. Now this pulley is uh, rotated fast so thereby the belt will be coming going like this. Now when the belt is run like this positive charge will be literally sprayed on to the belt from the positive terminal of the power supply. Being an insulated material uh, the charge cannot leak away so therefore these charges will be carried up like this and at the they will be transferred high voltage terminal from the belt again because of these sharp needle like points. So thereby charge can be transferred continuously from the power supply via the belt to the high electric thereby the high voltage will be increased. So here we have the ion source which provide the uh, positive ions which are to be accelerated and uh, because of the existence of the high electric field inside the pipe these ions will be accelerated and then we can extract the beam outside and uh, we get the accelerated beam. The following animation illustrates the working of a Van de Graaff accelerator. Uh, so we have the high voltage power supply then the two pulleys P1 and P2 or which the insulated belt uh, will travel and uh, here we have the two sets of star points one connected from the positive terminal of the battery uh, to very close to the surface of the belt <coughs> and the other one at the top connecting the surface of the belt to the high voltage dock. So when the motor starts and the pulleys are rotating the belt moves up and uh, the positive charges from the power supply will be sprayed onto the belt and this will be carried upwards and at the top these are collected again by the sharp points and then given to the high voltage dock. So that becomes positively charged and as the belt moves again more and more charges are collected by the high voltage dock and the voltage gradually increases. So therefore we have the high voltage increasing on the high voltage dome and there's a maximum voltage depending on certain conditions will be established on the high voltage dome. I had mentioned that positive charges are being literally sprayed from the corona points onto the insulated belt. Uh, however, in reality what happens is that these corona points connected to the positive terminal of the power supply pull off electrons from the insulated belt which thereby acquire positive charge. Now inside the high voltage dome the positive charge on the belt pulls off the electrons from the corona points connected to the high voltage dome. The dome thereby acquires positive charge. So as the belt moves up uh, from the corona points um, connected to the power supply to the corona points connected to the dome more and more charges are being sprayed on to the high voltage dome. So therefore the voltage develops. So this process repeats just building up the voltage on the dome. The largest potential sustained so far by a Van de Graaff accelerator has been 25.5 million volts which was achieved in the accelerator in the Holyfield radioactive ion beam facility in Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Of course there is scope for increasing the ion energy further without using higher voltages. Uh, if we can use two such accelerators in tandem the energy can then be doubled. Uh, the principle of the tandem accelerator is of course uh, by combining two stages of the Van de Graaff acceleration. First accelerate singly charged negative ions to V volts. Then some of the outer electrons are stripped off to get multiply charged positive ions with a net charge of plus Q. Then these positive ions are further accelerated from V volts to ground potential. So therefore the net energy will be the sum of the energies achieved in the two stages. So therefore Q plus 1 EV. The ions can be stripped off a few electrons by passing them through a column of gas or a thin carbon foil which is called the stripper foil. The collisions with the gas atoms or the carbon atoms lead to electron removal from the outer atomic shells thus leaving multiply charged positive ions. These are subsequently accelerated to the ground potential. So this is the schematic diagram of the 
tandem winding of accelerator. So here uh, we have the high voltage terminal in the middle and the ground potential points are on either side. So from one side we start with negative ions uh, from an appropriate ion source. So these are released in the ground potential um, region. So they are accelerated towards the high voltage terminal and inside the high voltage terminal uh, we have the stripper foil. So these ions when they pass through the stripper foil or the stripping gas medium um, a few of their outer electrons are stripped and they become positive ions. So therefore being inside a positively charged um, terminal they will be accelerated towards the ground potential point um, and when they reach the periphery of the accelerator their energy will be increased to the value that we have seen earlier. As before the entire assembly will be kept inside the high pressure tank. Now the earlier Van de Graaff machines used a continuous insulating belt to transfer charge to the terminal. At times this had the problem of wear producing dust and stoppages of the accelerator. In the 1960s a better idea emerged which was first put forward by her. The idea was to use a chain of metallic pellets. What are these pellets? They are conductive tubes connected by links made of insulating material in place of the insulating belt. So in the old Weindegraaff machines we had the continuous belt of made of the insulating material whereas now in the modified accelerator we have the pellet chain. So these are the metallic pellets and they are joined together via insulating materials. The advantage is that the pellet can operate at a higher velocity than a rubber belt without wear creating dust and stoppages while producing higher voltages and currents. Also the chain can be more uniformly charged than the belt and higher voltages can be achieved thereby. Now we come to the other type of accelerators namely radio frequency or RF accelerators. The necessity for unnecessarily very high voltages in the electrostatic accelerators can be avoided if we can increase the number of stages of acceleration. This requires that at each stage of acceleration the direction of the field should be the correct one. A straightforward solution is by using several lower voltage power supplies. A more economical solution is to use a single lower voltage power supply alternating its polarity in time or in other words use an RF power supply. The evolution from electrostatic field to the use of RF voltage was suggested by Widrow. Of course the implementation is rather simple. Um, we can arrange several coaxial metallic tubes one after the other with a small gap in between the adjacent ones and then connecting the odd numbered ones to the one of the terminals of the RF power supply and the even numbered ones to the other terminal. And uh, such a proposal was first made by Ising in the year 1924. This is the so called linear accelerator, LINAC. So here we have a waveform of the RF voltage with a maximum voltage of Vm. So we have the several coaxial beam pipes. The alternate terminals are connected to one terminal of the power supply. So we can see that terminals 1 and 3 are connected to one terminal and the even number terminals 2, 4 etc will be connected to the other terminal. And there are accelerating gaps in between adjacent beam pipes. And you can notice that the beam pipes are not all of the same length. In fact, as the iron progresses along the axis of the accelerator, um, of course, increasing their energy step by step, the length of the beam pipes will gradually increase. The reason we will see shortly. So if we have the voltage Vm, the maximum voltage, which occurs when the ion is in between two adjacent beam pipes. So therefore the ion will see an acceleration um, across the gap. So they will enter the next beam pipe with a higher velocity and therefore a higher energy. So at the peak of the first half cycle, the energy of the particles will be E is equal to E0 plus QVM where Q is the um, charge and E0 is the initial energy with which the ions enter the accelerator. So in the first half cycle, 1 and 3 are positive whereas 2 and 4 are negative. 
so therefore a positive ion will see an accelerating field from 1 to 2 so their energy will be increased of course the RF is usually supplied via high power klystrons usually a klystron is used as an amplifier so an input signal is required and this input signal is provided by a low power oscillator typically called an RF driver now in the second half cycle 2 and 4 will be positive and 1 and 3 will be negative that means at the peak of the second half cycle so once again the ion would have reached the gap between 2 and 3 so therefore there again the ion sees an accelerating voltage to the next beam pipe so once again the velocity will be increased and thereby the energy also will be increased so at peak of the second half cycle the energy will be E0 plus twice Q into Vm so continuing like this after traversing n such accelerating gaps the total energy will be En is equal to E0 plus n times Q into V in M so therefore by increasing the number of stages one can go on increasing the energy of the accelerated particles so this is the principle of the linear accelerator LINAC therefore in each successive tube the energy and hence the velocity of the ions will be successively higher in fact the energy will be given by square root of 2 En by M this velocity will be constant inside the nth tube n being 1 2 3 etc so inside any tube the velocity of the ions will be constant since the field inside a hollow conductor uh, will be the same throughout its length the time to traverse the length of this tube is tn is equal to ln by vn where ln is the length of the nth beam pipe to continue getting accelerated at the next gap the ion should arrive at the gap exactly after one half of a period of the RF field that means the time Tn should be equal to T by 2 where T is the period of the RF and this will be a constant so the required condition for this to uh, be achieved is that the length of the tube should be correspondingly larger or Ln is equal to Vn the velocity in the nth beam pipe multiplied by the time required to traverse that beam pipe which is T by 2 one half cycle so therefore Ln is equal to T Vn by 2 so it is obvious that as we go on increasing the velocity of the particles that means as the particles get accelerated again and again uh, in the accelerating gaps the length of the corresponding beam pipe should become larger and larger therefore the successive tubes get longer and longer but the ions travel with the same speed inside any one tube so therefore the tubes are known as drift tubes we see that as the energy requirement is higher the accelerator becomes unwieldy in length so that is one basic disadvantage of the linear accelerator for example the longest existing LINAC is the Stanford linear accelerator at the Stanford University the total length of the accelerator is 2 miles this is an aerial view of the accelerator installation so at the center you can see the um, line along which the beam pipes are going this is the axis of the beam pipe the maximum energy is about 30 GeV for protons I will end this video at this point no discretion or accelerators will follow in my forthcoming video which forms part 2 of the physics and applications of accelerators till then goodbye